there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in the message that we've been doing for the last couple of weeks, this is the third week, as a matter of fact, called A Clear and Present Danger. And it's an end times message about the, the church in the end days. So we're going to continue on right now, as I said, right after I ask for God's blessing on our time together. Lord, that you would, your spirit would lead me in all that I say and all that I do, Lord. Our desire is to hear from you, not for people to hear from me, but for all of us to hear from you. Lord, we just want to come and be in that place where we are being led by your spirit in paths of righteousness according to your word. So we praise you and bless you, Lord, that we might know the truth and be set free from all of the lying tongues that surround us. All right. As I said, this is the third part of our study in, uh, uh, that we've been doing called The Clear and Present Danger. And the message was precipitated. If you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, you probably, you, I'm sure you know, this was precipitated by a document that was authored by the Roman Catholic Pope, Pope Francis, along with the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Ahmed Al-Tayeb, in February of 2019, just a little while ago, as a matter of fact. So rather than bringing an, a new understanding of interfaith relations between Christians and Muslims, that has expanded and refined the view on what they regard as the brotherhood of all mankind, regardless of spiritual belief. That said, please make note of the fact that in June of 2016, during Ramadan, Al-Tayeb, who is the spiritual leader of all of Sunni, of Sunni Islam, said on his daily television broadcast that anyone leaving the Muslim faith must renounce their apostasy or be killed. So while they're looking for unity with the Catholics, they're saying, well, if you become a Catholic, it's over and done. You're dead. So I don't know what kind of unity that is, okay? Um, I'm being facetious. It's not unity at all. Now, I spoke last week about the increasing movement towards the unification of denominations, typically growing in the direction of unity with the Roman Catholic Church. We're talking about the Lutherans and the Presbyterians and the Methodist the Church of England, how they, Pentecostals, as a matter of fact, all seeming to come into a fellowship with the Catholic Church that hasn't existed certainly in 500 years since uh, Martin Luther led the Protestant Reformation. Uh, as a matter of fact, in July of this year, in, no, no, it was July 2017, the Church of England Archbishop Justin Welby, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury, and John Sentamu, who is a um, Archbishop of York, which is the largest county, shire in England. The, and they're the two most senior leaders in the Church of England. They called on Christians to repent for the Protestant Reformation, which was sparked by Martin Luther's exposing the terrible and ungodly practice of selling indulgence, indulgences, which is reducing the punishment for your, your punishment for sins that you've committed. All right. Now, the Vatican claimed to control that, that ability, and Christ had already taken upon himself the punishment for our sins on the cross. But they were selling these indulgences, and at the time they were selling them to build the Vatican. And that's what Martin Luther spoke out against and why the church told him to stop or die, and he didn't stop. He said that he was, his life was sound, founded on the word, which was something new back then. And he said he, he could not do but stand on that. Right? So that is all part of the so-called ecumenical movement, which is, is taking place now, leading to the one world church that we see in Revelation chapter 13. And we talked about that in prior studies. All of that needs to be exposed and a warning sounded. Right? You need to be on guard. Blow the trumpet in Zion, right? Sound the alarm. But 
while the Muslim world and the church organizations that have left the word of God behind to protect their man-made traditions are indeed enemies of the cross of Christ. And that's a fact. Remember the words of Christ. In Matthew 5, I'm reading verses 43 to 48. You recognize this as the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than, they, than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that perfection is expressed in the love of all people, including your enemies, right? So Jesus said that, and remember that Paul also said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the ruler of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, Ephesians 6.12. Our warfare is against the ruler of the darkness of this world. Who's that? Who's the ruler of this world? Let me first say that it is neither the Pope nor the Grand uh, Imam. All right? It's not the President of the United States. It's not the President of Russia. It's not Kim Jong Un over in North Korea. All right? As usual, the truth is to be found only in the word of God. Because it says in Car in 2 Corinth, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world was blinded, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this world. Who is Paul talking about? Well, John, the apostle wrote in his first letter, 1 John 5, 19, that Satan has the power at the moment. The power of this world lies in the power, is, lies in the power of the evil one, right? But only those over those who have rejected the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is otherwise known as rebellion. You reject his authority, that's rebellion. So, Blinded minds and blinded eyes. Ezekiel wrote, Son of man, you live in the midst of the rebellious house, who have eyes to see but do not see, ears to hear but do not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Ezekiel 12, 2. If they're in rebellion, they can't see, they can't hear, they're blinded. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. Our defense is the truth, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation to protect our brains, the way we think. And our weapon is the word, the sword of the Lord. Satan does not have that weapon, which is why, since the very, very beginning, he has worked at disarming the people of God. And that the first attack that he made it says in Genesis 3, 1, Now the serpent was more crafty, more subtle, than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The first thing he did was to call the word into question. Now, there's nothing new under the sun. He's been doing the same thing all along. And more than ever, that's exactly what he is doing today. Indeed, has God said, but now the devil is disarmed, right? When he had disarmed, when he, Jesus, had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. The devil has been disarmed. He has no weapon. You know, it says in Isaiah, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Satan has no weapon. He comes as a thief. John 10, 10. But he is a particular type of thief, a con man, 
He can't bop you on the head and take what's rightfully yours. Can't do that. He has to convince you to give it to him. That's what a con man does. He talks you into giving up what is rightfully yours. The word of truth is our weapon. Satan only has the lie because he's the father of lies and a liar by nature. John 8, 44. When he twists the word and corrupts it, when he adds to it or takes from it, that is his Bible. We call it the Living International Edition, the L-I-E. So beware the lying pen of the scribes, Jeremiah, God born through Jeremiah back in Jeremiah 8.8. 8. So I want to talk today as we're coming to a conclusion about three things that I see as the danger spots in the life of a Christian today. And those three things are CCC, culture, compromise, and Catholicism. Now, don't jump to conclusions here, right? Culture. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate and to keep it. Genesis 2.15. To cultivate. That's how you come up. That's where the word culture comes from. To cultivate, it comes from, from the Latin, and it means to cause growth in a desired way. God put Adam in the garden, and he was supposed to tend, tend the garden, right? Make it grow in the way that it should. Christianity has a culture. Okay? Are you, are, think about that now. There is a culture of Christianity, a desired result. Look in the Sermon on the Mount, and you will see it. Glory. That's what our culture, it, it talks about the way we're supposed to act, the way we're supposed to speak, the way we're supposed to believe. That's our culture. But the world has a culture and a desired end. The God of this world, the adversary who comes to kill, is tending it day by day, and it is increasingly more like him day by day. Have you noticed? I mean, I can't believe, you know, I, I, I once was young and now I'm old. You know, I, I've been at this for a, a number of decades now, and I can't believe the change. Well, I can believe it because I see it. But it's hard to understand the change that has taken place in the culture of this country in the, in, a, in the last 40 years. I mean, things that are taking place today would have been absolutely inconceivable 40 years ago, 20 years ago. I mean, the language, the, the way people act, the way people behave, the homosexuality, the fornication, the language. Okay. But what's the desire then? Satan comes to kill. That's his desired end is to separate you from God. But he does it little by little. You know, you don't cultivate, you don't go out into a garden and plant something and pop, it's up. It needs to be tended. It needs to be watered. It needs to be cared for. Satan is cultivating his ungodliness in the world today. We need to be on guard. Think about this. And I think this is something that really has become clear in the not too distant past because of computers and, and computing. The word and life are binary. It's right. Jesus said, let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is evil. Matthew 5, 37. And Jesus also said in Matthew 12, 30, he who is not with me is against me. You're either for him or against him. There's no, there's no gray intermediate ground. There's no, it's clear, it's either yes or no. It's either you're for him or you're against him. You either believe or you disbelieve. I remember years ago, Alice and I were living here in Florida and we had friends in New York where we had come from and they were coming down to visit us and the young lady was uh, pregnant at the time. So I called to make arrangements for their air, air for the flight from uh, up, up north down to Orlando. And when I called, I said, I mentioned to the, the people in the reservation office, I said, you know, the, the woman is pregnant. And the woman, she said, how pregnant is she? And it just popped out of me. I said, completely, you fool. <laughs> I mean, you either are or you're not. It's not like, okay, I understand, you know, but uh, you're either a believer or you're not a believer. 
You either believe the word or you don't believe the word. If you believe a lot of the word, you want to know something? You don't believe the word. The command of God is that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. If you don't love the Lord your God with all your heart, maybe you don't love the Lord at all. It's just worth a consideration. Isaiah, the prophet, said, Woe to the rebellious children who execute a plan but not mine, make an alliance but not of my spirit in order to sin, add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the safety of Pharaoh will be your shame and the shelter in the shadow of, your, of Egypt your humiliation, Isaiah 30, verses 1 to 3. Now think about that. The people of God became the people of God when God sent Moses into Egypt to deliver them out of that bondage, out of that land, to take them into the promised land. And he did it by, I mean, what mighty, miraculous things did he have to do to get the Pharaoh to release them? And I'm sure, you know, you all know the account. So Pharaoh finally says, okay, you know, you can go and worship your God. And they come, and they come to the Red Sea, an impassable, impossible boundary between them and the promise of God. But you know what? No promise of God has ever failed to come to pass. So they began to doubt, and they began to fear. And one of the first things they said was, why don't we go back to Egypt? These are the perilous last days. And if danger arises in your life, if you see what's going on in the world, are you going to go back to Egypt? and look for safety there, there is no safety there. You need to be on guard against compromise. God delivered you from there. Don't go back there, all right? You know what Paul, I'm sure you know what Paul wrote. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove, so that you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. Don't seek to be relevant. Pursue righteousness. That's what it says in 1 Timothy 6.11. Pursue righteousness. There seems to be such pressure to be relevant, to, to be like the world. Why? So you're accepted by the world. Isn't that, do you, can you understand that? Can you see that? I pray you don't see it in your own life, but it says let a man examine himself. You can't make a deal with the devil. He will always hate you and work to make you miserable and dead. That's his only purpose. Think, think about this now. Who's the most wise man that ever lived? Who did God give the most wisdom to? Solomon, right? In 1 Kings 3, 1, it says, Solomon formed a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. He made an alliance with Egypt, with the Pharaoh, by marrying one of his daughters. Now it goes on in 1 Kings 11, in verses, verses 1 to 11. Listen to this. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. So the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and will give it to your servant. There's always consequence to sin. And trust me, compromise is sin. I've always said compromise is taking, like taking your white robes of righteousness and waving them in the air as a flag of surrender. So later, Solomon would write in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 2.17. Think about this. So I hated life, for the work in which it had been done under the sun was grievous to me. Because everything is futility and striving after wind. He had power, fame, riches, wives, and concubines, all that the world had to offer. 
but he did not have peace. He did not have joy. And he did not have a right relationship with the Lord. And it all came through compromise. So consider this carefully. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said, this is Jesus, right? And said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, 34 to 7, 37. That's what compromise does. It's trading your soul for the things of the world. It's, it's natural for man, especially for the natural man, to seek the easy way. But remember, Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad, easy, right? That leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few that find it. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Like I said, it's binary. As Jesus also said in the Sermon on the Mount, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon, wealth, right? Matthew 6, 24. It's binary. It's either God, the word, or it is the world and the devil, who is the God of this world. Joshua said it when the people were coming into the promised land. He said, if it's disagreeable in your sight to, to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. You have to be on guard against the culture. Right? It's so easy to want to be like that, to be accepted, to be liked. All right? I said Catholicism is the third one. Now, I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. Catholicism, you can study the word and decide on it. I'm speaking of what the word actually means. And what the word actually means is broad or wide ranging in taste, interest or the like, having sympathies with all, broad-minded and liberal, universal in extent involving all, of interest to all, universal relating to all men, all inclusive. Now that's what the dictionary says, a random house dictionary says that. Okay, that's what Catholic means. A one world church, it's gonna be very, very Catholic. It's gonna embrace everybody who will bow before the, the Antichrist. This study started because of a very Catholic or universal message by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al Azhar, Ahmed al Taib. That's what I said at the beginning. It's about the brotherhood of man. It's all inclusive. Now, that's not scriptural, but it sounds so nice. It sounds so good. And yet it is without doubt completely contrary to the word of God. Remember what Satan Did God really say? That's what he said in the garden. Jesus certainly did say this. Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Matthew 12, 48 to 50. That's the church. That's, that's the body of believers. Whoever will do the will of the Father. As we've often said before in this study, it's a desire of the Father that none perish. But salvation, eternal life, is only available through Jesus. It says in Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There's only one way. Jesus said it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 14, 6. I doubt very seriously that Pope Francis said that to the Grand Imam.
It's not through works, but by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. He alone is the answer. Listen to what I'm going to say now and ponder this. The church is not the answer. The church is the result of the answer because Jesus is the answer. The church is a body of believers. Okay? But even if we, Paul said, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached to you, he is to be accursed. And he went on to say, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Galatians 1, that's verses 8 and 10. If you're trying to please men, you're not going to be able to please God. Jesus said, I will build my church. I said it's digital. I don't know if you know in Matthew 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares. The enemy came and planted tares in the wheat field of the man that owned it, right? And he woke up in the morning and my goodness, what an increase. Did he start thanking God for the increase? I hope not, but I think a lot of people in the church today would, okay? Because Satan would love to introduce heretics, this unbelievers, into the church. And believe me, he has done that, and he's done that a lot. Because people are joining a social club. How can you tell the wheat from the tares? Well, the fact of the matter is it's really, really difficult. Because they look the same. Now, at the end, when they start to bear fruit, the tares are not going to bear fruit. And ultimately, that's what it boils down to. And that's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You will know them by their fruit. And what's the fruit? It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is that love. It is that joy. It is that peace. It is. Go look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians and see if that's evident in your life. You know, always start. It says, let a man examine himself. We need to examine ourselves. That's what Paul said. As we are, if we're content with religious activities, that are not necessarily pleasing to the Lord. And believe me, most religious activities are not pleasing to the Lord. Think about what God spoke to Amos, all right? During the time of Amos the prophet, he said in chapter five, alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness, not light, as when a man flees from a lion and bear, and a bear meets him, or flees from a lion and a bear meets him or goes home, leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? And God goes on, he says, I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. You may like the music in your in your, your congregations. The question is, does God? Because remember, he's not listening to something that's going to tickle his ears. He's searching the hearts to see something that professes love for him. Do we desire a pure, intimate relationship with him? And the family of God? Is that what is that what our church, our experience is? It's going to boil down to this question. Are we noble-minded like the Bereans were? In the book of Acts, chapter 17, I'm going to read verses 10 to 12. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Are you a Bible-believing Christian? A bondservant of Christ, living by, the, by faith? or just a church member living by tradition? 
You know, I was sharing with Alice that God's put on my heart to talk about rude righteousness. Sometimes when you're going to behave like God wants you to, it's going to sound rude to people. You're called to speak the truth in love, the life-giving truth in love. But a lot of people don't want to hear the truth because oftentimes the truth is, hey, you need to straighten up and fly right. We need to hear that. We need to pray that God will discipline us because he disciplines those whom he loves, that we might become partakers of his holiness. We need to make sure that our lives are lining up with the word of God, not with the tradition of men. And we need to be on guard against religions that, are, that have rejected the word of God, that are so far from the word of God with their traditions and their practices and their behavior. And it's so commonplace, but that's where the world is going right now. It is in descent. There is a remnant. A remnant is a small piece. And that's what's going to be left of the people of God. The children of God is a remnant. We need to be that remnant. We need to be that people who are committed to the Lord. And you know what? We need to be asking to the Lord. We need to be saying, Lord, send your spirit to show us what needs to change in our lives. And give us a heart willing to be changed. That we might be more and more like you. We are to be transformed. That's a process. Transformed by the renewing of our mind. And renewing our mind means taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. The worldly church is in big trouble. It is turning its back on the word of God. Now, if you can't see that, maybe you're not testing it. Or maybe you just don't know the word of God. Or maybe you're just believing the lie. The one thing I will say about Martin Luther is maybe we need reformation again. A lot of people are praying for revival. Maybe we just need reform. It's time to decide. It's time to decide. We need to know what we want to do, what we want to be. I want to be like Jesus. So, Father, I thank you, Lord God, that you are at work, both to will and to work your good pleasure in our lives that you are the potter and we are the clay and you're molding us and shaping us to fulfill your promise and none of your promises have failed to come to pass. That those whom you have foreknown, the bond servants, you are going to conform them into the image of your son, Christ Jesus. That's what we want to be. We want to be like, we want to look like, we want to sound like, we want to act like your son, Christ Jesus regardless of the cost. I said when we started this In Search of Christianity years ago, Christianity, true Christianity, is devotion and commitment to Jesus Christ without concern for the cost. Now you said count the cost. You need to know what it is. But you're willing to pay any cost to follow Jesus Christ. That needs to be our heart. Pray for me that I will remain true to the end. We will pray for you that that is what's going on, that all of the, the, all of the untruth that is out there and it's growing, it's like a sewage pit out there getting worse by the day, that those robes of righteousness that God has given you, that the full armor of God will protect you from being contaminated by it. But be on guard that you are not contaminated. Check your life. Check what's in your heart. You can check what's in your heart by what comes out of your mouth. So, I pray that you've been blessed by this. Don't forget to write to us at BibleTalk.com with any comments or questions you have. Office at BibleTalk.com. Did I say that? We'd love to hear from you. So, until the next time, and I'm not quite sure what that study will be, we just bless you and pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you. Of your
Almighty love.